Well, hello again. We've got a um, Hearth gearbox. Not done one of these before. Let's get stuck in. So we'll do a quick walk around. Many, many people have got these gearboxes. I don't know which one of these it is. It's possibly a HBW100 or something of that variant. Uh, the, typically the data tag, long, long gone. Um, yeah, no idea what, what's going on or where it is. So these boxes are similar, I suppose, to PRM's mechanically actuated boxes. These use uh, ATF fluid, like a lot of gearboxes now. Um, but these use a very different type of clutch. They use a uh, wet multi-plate clutch. So anyone with a motorbike is going to be very familiar with what's inside here. Although the arrangement is similar, they behave differently to a motorbike clutch. But nonetheless, it's, it's wet multi-plates and you basically have a cage. Um, but we'll have a look inside in a minute. We'll see how it works. I'm going to take it apart um, and I will attempt to put it together in part of the casing and show you its operation. Excuse the big dog barking away. Mersh, behave! He's listening to me today. Anyway, let's get it apart and have a look inside. There we go, we're inside the box. So that was fairly straightforward. Um, the first thing you should probably be aware of is that the oil in it is brown, which is very bad. It's ATF fluid in there, which should be a nice bright shiny red. And this means that the box has had serious um, heat problems or the clutch has slipped and we've got damage to the clutch plates. Now this box was slipping and causing issues and it was changed for that very reason. Um, let me get this wire out of the way because I think it's probably going to drive me mad as much as you guys. So I think the battery this is good. So basically, it's a very simple arrangement <laughs> in as much as gearboxes are simple. You have your input shaft. Again, this is mechanically driven all the time by a combustion engine. So it's always going to be delivering rotational forces round. Um, as it spins, you can see that the gear on one side is going one way and the gear on the other side is uh, going the opposite direction. Yeah. So this cage here is what allows the clutch packs to be compressed or depressed, or compressed or depressed. Depressed, so this is your neutral position, I think. Uh, no, I stand corrected, this is actually a slit gear. I'm gonna try and select this and help you have you watch. So, before I do that, this is the other half of the casing. This is your selection yoke, okay? This floats around this part here, as this spins all the time, yeah? As you can see, it's spinning. The yoke will float around this part here. And then when you use your lever on the side, which is controlled by your Morse controller, this little gubbings in here it will work. I'm trying to do it one-handed, as always, it's difficult. will work on the yoke. And the yoke will simply slide backwards and forwards to pull the, cl the, the clutch pack in a head or a stern, or neutral. So I shall try and show you what I'm talking about. They're a bit finicky these, if you just pull them in one direction. Oh, that's gone into the other gear. There we go. So now we have neutral. I'll try and show you neutral. All the bearing races are dropping out on this, so it might be hard to spin it. So now, there you go. This is not spinning anymore. The centre bit isn't spinning. We've got free, free wheeling of the gears. Okay, so now you, your prop 
it's not quite neutral it's actually got stuck on one side a bit but that's because i'm not a machine there we go now we're in neutral properly right so there's your free spin and there's that can now spin freely uh, the propeller can free, free spin okay the way to think about these clutches is the if anyone ever it remembers from like crikey I'm, I'm that old now the 80s or early onwards the, the, the Blue Peter used to show you funny tricks with telephone directories. Now, for anyone who doesn't know about this stuff, just Google it. It's far easier. But if you layer things on top of itself many, 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 many times, if you get two really old books like a telephone directory and lay each page on top of each other, the friction of all those pages make it impossible to pull that those books apart. Same principle here. You've got your clutch packs and drive plates all layered together. Now, when you've got neutral, there's a tiny bit of clearance to allow them to slip past each other. And with the oil in there, it will slip and flow. Okay. But once you use your control lever, which pushes the yoke and uses the spring tension to lock, you hear that click? Now we've got positive drive. Well, hang on. Positive drive is a strong word. I would say that's debatable. A gear is a positive drive because it physically cannot slip or move. This this has the ability to slip, hence why it's failed. So maybe it's not a positive drive, but I'll let you just decide that in the comment section. Basically now what's happened is the spring tension is crushing these clutch packs and that's gripping them together. And then with the oil and stuff, you're getting drive. So as the engine comes through, you'll get drive. And I can't resist that now. That's trying to pick itself out of the way. So then if you want to come back to neutral, obviously you have to get the damn thing to respond to my hand movements, but springs are a bit finicky. Whoop. Let's just get that back to neutral. A bit of pressure. Right. There we go, back to neutral. So then if you want to go the other direction, obviously you would then slip to the opposite direction. And that would then lock the clutch back again in the opposite direction. So again, this shaft, input shaft, always going the same direction as the engine. Typically speaking, this is going anti-clockwise because the front of the engine will be going clockwise, looking at the back of the fly will be going anti-clockwise, and then this would be, so it would be going the other way around, I suppose. But different engines can have different uh, directions, and it's not a strict rule, it's a general guide. Right, that's come out now, unfortunately. Right, so there you go, we've got opposite direction. Now, one of the reasons why these boxes are what I would call a light duty box is unlike a hydraulically driven set of clutches like on the PRM 150, you know, a Delta 20 like you've seen in my previous videos. If you haven't already seen those, have a look, check them out. These are limited by the spring pressure, tension, whichever way around you want to look at it. Um, th there's a limited amount of force on there. And once the clutches slip, they just give up and they, they're not very forgiving these boxes and one of the things i find that can be a big killer of these type of boxes this specific type of clutch pack is a weak morse controller you don't get full correct full selection it partly selects the clutch and therefore it allows it to slip because it's not giving it a full lock so this it's partly sliding this into place and it can cause premature wear in the gearbox or at least that's what i found you often tell that's happening with someone when they go clunk and you hear a mighty thump and what's happening is the gearbox is spinning really fast because the engine's revving up but the gearbox isn't isn't engaging in drive and then at some point it slams into a drive and then it will crush you all this torque really fast spinning prop and it will slam into drive and it will just chew up these clutches and and drive plates and you'll get heat damage and heat can cause the plates to warp and then once they warp, they don't release correctly and they can drive and they can cause the pedal to, to pick up. So, these boxes are simple enough in many ways, but they're not as forgiving as some of the newer systems out there. Um, I'm not a big fan of these personally, not against them, just, you know, they're a bit finicky. And also, they're, they're kind of getting to be hard to get parts for now. You can get the drive plates and the friction plates. But the problem is, is once you've had heat damage in here, you're dealing with things that are tensioned uh, or sorry tempered so spring steels all these little springs they're going to suffer with heat they'll lose their tension and ability to do the job properly so it's getting those little finicky little bits to do the job properly inside if you're going to rebuild one of these it's not impossible just 
they're not as easy to do. Many of us call these throwaway boxes, which I hate. I hate throwing things away. But unfortunately, I'm, I've already accumulated stuff and I have to have to be ruthless and throw things out. I digress. I like waffling. So these boxes make use of taper bearings. So I'll take this shaft out and you can have a look. So they have um, taper. If you know what a taper is, basically a chamfered edge. So the idea is that they will take up thrusting forces. They're good bearings, taper bearings, but you have to shim them out. And the reason you have to do that is because every, even though manufacturers of bearings are super precise, you have the casings to consider, things like that. So you have these shim packs. And they're a special type of thickness. So when you put the casings together, you put one end on, and then you will torque everything down, and then you'll bottom all the um, outer races in. But you have to allow an amount of clearance, as it's called. Because once it runs up to temperature, things will expand slightly, and you need to have just the right amount of room for the bearing to run naturally and comfortably, and not be restricted by the casing and the clamping forces. It's a little bit of a game, um, but whether or not I have to stress about that, because I don't know if I'm going to even bother rebuilding this. I think I may take this clutch pack apart for you and show you the more closer inner workings, but um, I will have to fade out and bring you back. So bear with me, I'll get that done. So oh, we're inside a bit more. So there's some needle bearings. These just take side loads if you like. I'll get those out of the way. There's a drive plate and it's got a nice coating on it and this is what gets chewed up on these boxes. So these actually absorb oil and grab it and allow it to help do the work of driving things, believe it or not. So there's one of your drive plates. Now looking at this, Seem worse looking down it looks flat enough and there's one of your friction plates so again these are coated similar to um, the cone on a uh, 120 PRM or so the Borg Warner for example have got um, uh, clutch plates and drive plates and they're very similar it's just splines or your, your gears if you like your teeth to drive the damn thing and that will grab onto your friction plates this is one of the clutches. I suspect this is the stern clutch. I haven't actually got that far yet, as you can tell. Doesn't it seem worse? That's just getting in here. Okay. Now this is one of those things that once you take apart, it goes bling, 
thing and things are flying about all over the place. There's pins and springs and detents and all sorts. They drive me mad. They're, they're so fiddly, these things. I'm not a big, big fan of them really. Ow! Pinch my finger, doesn't help. So say, this is all gonna go pinging around the room. Okay, actually, I'll get to on that. I'll get those springs out. Quite there yet. There we go. So there's part of the cage. I mean, they've got they've got a very cool kind of cam action on how they drive. So I flip this over. So you can make out inside here you've got these little ball bearing cams so there's three ball bearings on top of here get these springs out of the way I'll show you what I'm talking about so that will run so look at this action here if I twist this it's causing it to cam up and that camming action that's what causes the clutch packs to lock together yeah but as I say these are limited they're only able to do so much movement so arguably, are they a strong design? I don't know. I mean, personally, I would say that they, they have a limited construct. Um, you can only travel so far. So what I'm picking at, say like a ball corner, is hydraulic action. There's, there's no limit to how much that can depress upon the clutch packs. Um, assuming the clutch packs are gripping at all, you'll get some level of drive. Whereas these, I think, have a tendency to be very limited in that fact. But really cool engineering. I mean, look at that. I love, I love things like this. It's a little twist and it goes up, it's like a helical kind of design. And here's your spring-loaded detents that give you a positive lock. So these will, will allow this to run in and click into place and lock it into to its position. So I won't take that off yet. Take the ball bearings out of the way. We'll try and get into the other side of it. Not sure. I never say I'm clumsy. So here's your strip, well, I say stripped, it's semi-stripped down output shaft. Um, you've got your keys and the keyway still. I haven't got them out yet. Another uh, needle bearing. There's your main output bearing there with the race. And then this is your seal carrier. 
and that's what stops your X in the box. So there's not much to it really with this bit. Um, I just have to pull those out and then uh, I could take it apart, but there's not much to show you really. It's just simply to bearing support and shaft support. Um, there's a thrust, a thrust washer there or thrust bearing, so that will stop the cage from grinding. It will, it will float on a film of oil in here and that's what the, uh, the golden color is basically. Right, let's have a look at the... Lots of bits dropping everywhere. Never say I'm a clumsy brother. There we go. So opposite side. So there's there again. There's your there's your camming action. Um, well, I say that, but it's not actually camming because I haven't got it right. And there's your camming action. It would actually be the other way round. That'd be going down because this is your centre part. Yeah. So it's almost symmetrical part. There's your opposite board bearings. So we're going at this the opposite way round to what we did before. So. Here's your cage, and here's your clutch. And there's a drive plate. Friction plate. Uh, well, I've seen worse, I must admit. But for some reason it was slipping and breaking and not working. Whether or not I can get bits to rebuild this or not, that's a question. So I don't know whether or not that would be an option on this. Um, there's no major warpage or anything, so it's interesting that it, it wasn't working properly. And then there's your one of your gears. So um, helical gears, much better. In case you don't know what helical gears are, there's loads of literature and, and stuff online. But the, the way they work is that they're angled so that what you're getting is more surface area contact you're getting more than one tooth touching at a time i don't know if i can actually show you that without throwing half the gearbox on the floor i'll try and show you there you probably can't actually see from there no it's the wrong gear anyway that's the that'll run free let's go back to the input Yeah, there's a bearing in the way, but basically the idea being is that as the gears mesh, you haven't just got straight cut gears, it's one tooth at a time taking all that load. You've got two sets of gears spreading that load because at an angle, there's more than one point of contact and that makes gears much stronger. So back in the earlier days, gears were simple. Um, and then as they started to learn how gears work and developing new ideas, they found ways to spread the load. If you spread the load on gears, you don't get one tooth cracking and breaking, and then of course the whole drivetrain fails. So this this type of gearing is very modern, very current, um, and they prove to be very hard wearing and long lasting. So to gear wise, these are just as good as any other box, I suppose. Uh, the hardening processes, I would imagine, aren't, aren't much different. One thing I did notice though is uh, the box that replaced this was a an M10. I think it's an M10. Um, basically, there's a little cheeky thing that they did. So the input shaft is a standard SAE. So SAE is standard automotive equipment. And these splines, this diameter is a standard. It's used in all different applications across the board, marine, automotive, industrial, la 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 la. But the diameter of the other box was smaller than this and it really threw me off for a little while. It turns out what they've actually done is they've gone down, I think it was one or two millimeters in diameter to use cheaper bearings. And it's just like, um, and then they were calling that shaft the same as this standard, but it isn't, it's different. And it basically the point they're making is that the drive plate will go around this and then drive it. You're getting less contact teeth into the troughs of there. So you weren't getting as much positive. Well, it was a weaker design, yeah, I would say. But anyway, these sorts of things are things to spot and watch and, and learn from. Now I've got a big pile of mess on the table. Um, I'm not gonna do anything else to it right now. There's not much else to show you really. Um, a quick tour of the inside of the bottom of the box you didn't see. So as before, here's your input shaft, here's your lay gear. So this will this will give you the reverse. And that's driving the other gear at the back, which wasn't in contact with this one. And basically this is just full of oil. It's splash fed. It's not oil fed, there's no high pressure oil in here. It's just splash fed. So you need to fill the box up to a limit, not too high. Go much higher than that, you actually build up pressure and it can cause the box to, to, to leak oil out of the seals and that sort of stuff. So basically, 
the hearth boxes are, well these hearth boxes are a mechanically um, operated driven box with a mechanically actuated selection of the clutch packs. And as I said before, the clutch packs have a limitation on how much uh, grabbing action they've got, if you like. And to me, that's a weak point in that particular design. But these boxes have been around for a very long time. As long as you're gentle and use them with respect, they'll last you a long, long time. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's what it is to cover with this, really. Um, I'm going to go and get cleaned up and uh, not smell of oil. If you enjoyed this content, please um, you know, give me a comment. Let me know what you think. I'd love to know more about what people want. I sort of keep guessing and the channel's still new and it seems to be growing nicely. People are enjoying the content. Um, but if you subscribe to the channel, I'd really appreciate it. That lets me know that what I'm doing is good and goes well and spread the word. It's, you know, let's build a community in that sense of the word. Part of what I'm trying to do here is share information to people. The boating world is such a strange place. People just don't know who to talk to, where to get information from. There are a few places and a lot of it's old fashioned word of mouth, but we live in the 21st century now. I do think this information should be readily available to people. I'm not expecting people want to be engineers as such or want to fix things, but just understanding the fundamentals of how things work, I think is really important to having a good, happy boat life. Um, if you just suddenly have something break and it's a mystery to you and the person fixing it isn't communicating clearly what's going on and why, I think that's not fair. I think that's, that's not how I prefer to do things because sometimes you look at a box like this and say is it worth fixing it the cost of repair to the customer generally speaking isn't worth it nowadays you, the money you'll spend paying someone like me to repair this and put it back into 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 service you go and buy another gearbox the only issue you've got with that is there's lots to consider when changing gearboxes as I say the shaft on this is a standard shaft the fitment on this how the gearbox fits to an engine is very similar to a lot of modern gearboxes so you could do a quick swap in some cases, provided the ratios are correct, as in what the rotations are compared to the engine speed and the propeller. Um, but there might be a difference in height. So that's all you have to consider with some of these things. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all just information. Once you have that information, you can make an informed choice. Again, hope you enjoyed the content. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.